Praise the Lord in the body. Amen. How y'all doing this morning? All right. It's uh, good to see everybody in the house this morning and uh, excited about what, what God's got in store for us today. So let's all stand and let's all uh, lift our hands this morning and let's get ready for worship. Dear God, we just thank you so much for, for this opportunity to come to this house again. God, I pray as we begin to lift up these, these songs of worship to you, dear Lord. God, I pray that, that it would just be beautiful to your ears, dear Lord. God, I pray that you would just let us worship this morning without reservation, dear Lord. God, I pray that we put everything else behind us, dear God. Jesus, don't be looking ahead to what's, what's coming in the next days, the next week, God. I pray that you would just let us focus on what you want to do in this house right now. And God, will just be careful to give you all the praise and glory you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all worship with us this morning.
one here in the church. But I tell you, you can see the thing you don't have to stand up this morning. But those of you that are behind this first row right here, it would motivate you if you were here looking out. These three sitting on this front row right here is just a blessing. Amen. But most of all, Hudson has brought his microphone with him. <laughs> and it ain't going to be long. He's going to be up here with the praise team. Amen. That's right. Gerald, you going to train him, ain't you? Oh, yeah. Gerald said he's going to get him trained. No, but it is a blessing to see little ones like this uh, worshiping. And I tell you, I thought about this all week long. I don't know why, but I, I did. Some people get on fire for the Lord, and then their fire just goes out. And then they come back on board for a few weeks or months, and they just all fired up again, and then all of a sudden it just goes back out. I pray for them. Because for one moment, for just a little while, the Lord has done something good in their life. So they all of a sudden on fire for the Lord. But then whenever something comes into their life that is a rock in the road, they get discouraged. And I feel that sometimes people kind of look away from God at that point and it's like, why me, Lord? Why is this happening to me? But what they don't realize is it's at that time that the Lord is closer to them than whenever they're on top of the mountain. Because he will get them through it. And there's been lots of times when I've had mountains in my path rocks in the road and it's easy to get discouraged but I encourage you just keep pressing on because those little rocks in your road are only there for a little while but to have a relationship with God keep him close walk with him let him help you let him be there for you and feel that that spirit is with you whenever you're down and you're having those times. That's the blessing. I don't know why I had to share that with you this morning, but I feel like somebody needs to hear that this morning. So that didn't cost you nothing. So I got just a few announcements this morning. Uh, let's remember Brother Eric Sis will be preaching for us next Sunday. Uh, that is January the 16th. Eric preached for us when? Probably about, about a month ago? Yeah. yeah, somewhere around about a month ago. And I tell you, if you weren't here and you missed it, don't miss this one on the 16th. Uh, Eric, he brought a great message. And uh, he's just all around a great guy. And the youth uh, interested in going to Winter Jam on January the 16th needs to see uh, Sister Teresa. And the ladies' ministry will meet Sunday, January the 23rd at 3 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall to discuss this year's events and for planning. Uh, food for friends items are needed uh, so we can refill our shelves. And the children's ministry will be starting a raffle for a large it's called a bog bag. S'mores, bar, uh, beach towels, and tons of goodies. So the tickets are $1. And you can see Cindy or Courtney Patton. I think those raffle tickets will be available starting Wednesday night. Okay. And uh, now I get to tell you a little bit about the men's ministry because it ain't on this list right here. And I've been putting it together. So uh, our men's ministry is going to be doing our gun raffle like we always try to do uh, for spring out. Uh, but the gun raffle probably will be drawn right before spring out. Um, 
but the gun raffle tickets will be available starting Wednesday. Um, I'll have them, and uh, if I can ask whoever would like to take some of those tickets, uh, I'll have them with me. You can see me, I'll get them to you. Uh, but as many as we can move, uh, the better. So uh, the gun's already been purchased, uh, so it's just waiting for a winner. And also, January the 27th, I believe that is a Thursday night uh, here in January, uh, the men's ministry is going to be holding a spaghetti supper. So you men, um, invite people to come to our spaghetti supper, uh, and be sure and tell them that there is no charge for the spaghetti supper. It's by donation. Uh, like we did for our pancake supper uh, last last year and the year before. Um, it's all by donation, okay? So if they want to come as your friend or whatever, they want to come to the spaghetti supper and they can't do a donation, that's fine. Tell them to come on fellowship with us anyway. But if they can do a donation, no donation is too small. And no donation is too large. Uh, so uh, that is January the 27th was our ride to that Thursday night. Um, so now we'll get into our prayer request uh, list here. Uh, let's remember these names that are on this prayer request this morning. Missy and Rodney Williams and New Life Baptist Church. Uh, Missy's battling cancer. Uh, Dewey Hubbard, Dorinda, Dorinda Webb, Caden Williams, and Randy Shelton are all battling cancer. Ashley Waller and Landon Hagwood, both are continuing treatment. Becca Butler, recovering from eye surgery. Charlie Bittinger, Charles Palmer, and Charlie Hubbard uh, need healing in their bodies. Skylar Farmer was in a wreck and is recovering from several surgeries. Hunter Bell, recovering from surgery after a head-on collision. And uh, Becky Soto is not feeling well. Um, also, I would like for you to remember uh, Mason Dalton. Um, she had a baby and had some uh, complications. Uh, she's in the hospital. Uh, if you all will, please remember uh, Mason Dalton. I believe her last name is Glenn. Glenn. Mason Dalton Glenn. I didn't even know what her last name was. I asked Cindy last night. I just know her by Mason Dalton. But, um, sweet girl. And, uh, you know, her first child, she had some complications. But let's remember her in our prayers as well. Do I have any prayer requests on my left side here? Any prayer requests on my right side? Courtney? I mean, yeah. No. Go ahead, man. My women's ministry leader, go ahead. guys to remember a um, co-worker of mine, uh, David Carl. 
problems with people that's been having some trouble. Um, he thought it was his gallbladder. We still don't know if that may be some complications and he thought he had a broke rib or, or whatever. Uh, wound up going to the emergency room. Was in the emergency room all night uh, Thursday night. And uh, then uh, Saturday, I think, yeah, yesterday, um, he called and told me that, uh, that they found a mass uh, in one of his lungs, but, you know, they don't know exactly, you know, what it is. I think he goes for a CAT scan uh, sometime maybe this week, so uh, if y'all just remember him, his name's David Crosby. If I can ask my usher to come on down this morning. It's good to see Brother Emmett in the house this morning. He's easing down through here. I'll let him stay seated until I got ready for him. He's going to get me with that uh, stick he's got outside one of his legs. I think he's, think he's threatening me with it. He's got it handy, though. It's all right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord God, I just thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to stand here in your house. Lord, I just thank you for being able to uh, to worship you freely. And Lord, I just thank you for each and every opportunity we have to come to Mount Pleasant Community Church. And Lord, I just thank you for each and every one that is here this morning. I thank you for who they are and I thank you for what they represent. Lord, I just thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able to come out to your house each and every Sunday and Wednesday. Lord, I just thank you for what you're going to do for our prayer request that we've made mention to you this morning. Lord, I just ask you to reach down and touch them in a mighty way as only you can. And Lord, I just thank you for our praise team. I thank you for what they do. I thank you for the, the songs of worship that they bring. But Lord, I just thank you for our pastor Levi. I thank you for what he represents. I thank you for what he stands for. But most of all, I thank you for, for his heart and his mind that he represents you and he brings forth what you would have him to say for our ears to, to hear. But Lord, I just thank you most of all for just being you. And thank you for, for walking with us and being with us and giving us comfort each and every day. And Lord, I just thank you for this tithes and offering that we're about to receive this morning. And I just ask you, Lord, that you just take it, break it, bless it, multiply it for your kingdom. And we ask all of this this morning in Jesus' Jesus name.
this morning. Yeah. I, uh, I sure enjoyed it myself. They're going to be doing some more stuff like that, so we're excited about that. And uh, learning some new songs. And it's fun to see how much energy the kids have when they come up and sing and how excited they are. And uh, sometimes it takes work to, to get us to you know, worship, um, but the kids, man, they're always, always ready and eager. So, if uh, if you'd like to sit down, you can this morning. I got a good bit of reading here that I want to, I want to do to begin my message and start to kind of build a foundation, and then we'll get on into the uh, the the meat and potatoes of the message, if you will. So, I hope everybody's had a great week. It's getting a little colder outside. And uh, I tell you what, spring will be here before you know it. So just, just hold on tight. All right. Um, well, my message this morning, I'll be going out of 1 Kings chapter 13. Um, but just to give you a little uh, a little bit of the, the pre-story before we get into the, the actual story here. Um, there was a, uh, a king. Uh, called Jeroboam, and he had taken over king for a gentleman by the name of Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam was one of the, the sons of Solomon, so he was of the house and lineage of the king of David, and he was over the, uh, the tribe of Judah. And so King Jeroboam, he did not want, he did not want to lose his authority, all right? He didn't want to lose uh, the position that, that he had found himself in. And so he was worried about the people going and making sacrifices to the God of David. And so King Jeroboam, he had decided that he was going to put up some idols for people to worship. And he put one up in Bethel, and he put one up in Dan, the city of Dan. And what he told the people was, he said, you know what? I want you to go and I want you to worship these idols. I want you to sacrifice to these things, which was completely against everything that King David had put in place. And so we find ourselves with people listening to King Jeroboam. They had been going and sacrificing to these idols. They had been worshiping, and it was uh, some calves that he had had made, some statues, and uh, they were worshiping these calves, and whether it be Bethel or whether it be Dan. And we find ourselves in 1 Kings 13, chapter 2, that a man of God approached King Jeroboam. And we're going to read about it this morning. It says, in starting with verse 2, it says, The man of God cried out against the altar by a revelation from the Lord. Altar, altar. This is what the Lord says. A son will be born to the house of David, named Josiah, and he will sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who are burning incense on you. Human bones will be burned on you. He gave a sign that day. He said, this is the sign that the Lord has spoken. The altar will now be ripped apart, and the ashes that are on it will be poured out. When the king heard the word that the man of God had cried out against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar and said, Arrest him. But the hand that he stretched out against him withered, and he could not pull it back to himself. He could not pull it back to himself. Now, this prophet, this man of God, he was just doing what God told him to do. And he wasn't saying anything incorrect. In fact, if you look at it, he was just speaking the word of God. He was obeying God. He was doing what God told him to do. But so many times, and we've talked about this before, so many times when we are that person that's in the wrong, we take offense to whoever comes and tries to give us correction, who tries to get us back on the right path or tell us, hey, if you keep doing this, something bad's going to happen. 
And a lot of times we don't like to hear that. We don't like to hear it. And we will get upset just as this king got upset. And we, we, we have a, a thing nowadays to where the young people, they, they call it, they said, you know, somebody's getting ready to throw hands. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Throw hands. You're getting ready to fight. You're upset. Our tempers start to flare. Emotions start to run high. And then you get ready to do something about it physically. Because you don't like either what was, what was told to you or what was portrayed to you. Or even that somebody came and, and even told you, hey, you're in the wrong. You're in the wrong. And it's hard for us to hear that sometimes. I said it a few weeks ago, if you're, if you're ever reading your Bible and it feels like you feel, you feel like it slaps you in the face, a slap in the face, it, it doesn't feel good. I don't know how many of y'all have ever been slapped in the face and walked out saying, man, that felt really awesome. Thank you so much. None of us probably have. A slap in the face is not going to feel good, but sometimes it's needed. Sometimes it's needed. Has, has any of y'all, like how many heavy sleepers do I have in here? Any heavy sleepers? Morgan, semi-heavy semi sleeper? Ethan's not in here, but he's a heavy sleeper. I remember when he and Ethan were, were growing up, we had some bumps in us uh, at one point in time. And as I told y'all before, I've never been a small person. Uh, even, even growing up, I mean, I, you know, I was always a, you know, a pretty big boy. And I was on the top bunk uh, one night. Well, I mean, that's where I'm on every night. But I was on the top bunk. That was my spot. And something had happened to the railing. I can't remember what happened to the railing. But we had to take the railing down because it was broke. And uh, it wasn't that night or anything like that. But sure enough, sure enough, I go twirling off the bed and fall. And I actually hit a table with my face that was down on the floor. And uh, it broke my nose. But it, it made a huge, loud, like thundering sound. And Mama and Daddy came rushing in there to find out what had happened. I mean, from all the way across the house, this is the middle of the night. From all the way across the house, because they knew, they said something. Something just happened. And they get in there, and I'm on the, the floor, you know, crying, screaming. Ethan's still just sitting there in the bottom bunk just asleep. Like nothing had ever happened. And it, it happened right there. So there's a lot of people that are heavy sleepers. And, you know, just like something like that, that the noise can be going on around them, and you can't get them up. So a lot of times you have to go over and kind of just slap them in the face a little bit or throw some water on them or do something like that. And it seems like those people, when they wake up, they're always like in shock. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, the eyes get real big, they got that you know, gasp of, of breath, you know. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there, there are so many times that we begin to fall asleep spiritually. And we need to be slapped in the face a little bit to wake us up. To wake us back up so that we can, that we can see what's going on in front of us around us, and so that we can be productive. We can be productive people in the kingdom of God. So it said that this king, he got upset. The man of God called him out, told him, hey, what you're doing is wrong. This altar's about to be ripped apart, and God's about to have his way. He didn't like it. He didn't like it because he was in a position of authority. He felt like in himself, who is, this, who is this man of God to come tell me, the king, what's about to happen and what I should do? I want you to know that there's a lot of people that are in positions of authority in this, in this church, in this community, in this nation, in this whole world. But don't none of them, don't none of them have the authority that Jesus has. Don't know them. Everybody answers to him. I don't care how much money you've got. I don't care how much power you got. I don't care who your mom and daddy was. It doesn't matter. Jesus had the final say so. And it says that, that when he when he stretched out his hand, 
from the altar and said, arrest him. It says that his hand withered. It withered. And it says that he couldn't pull it back to himself. <coughs> it says the altar then was ripped apart and the ashes poured from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Then the king responded to the man of God. Plead for the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me so that my hand may be restored to me. Funny how change, things change real quick, right? Somebody tells you, hey, this is about to happen. And you might not like it, but then it happens. And you're like, man, they knew. They knew. What happens is that you have gained credit with them. You have established some credit. You've established yourself in being correct. And so... This king, this king knew, he said, you know what, if, 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 this, if this man's God has the power to rip this altar apart, then he's got to have the power to restore my hand. So he asked him, he said, he said can, you, can you plead to your God that my hand may be restored to me? So the man of God pleaded for the favor of the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him. And it became as it had been at first. Then the king declared to the man of God, come home with me, refresh yourself, and I'll give you a reward. But the man of God replied, if you were to give me half your house, I still wouldn't go with you. And I wouldn't eat bread or drink water in this place. For this is what I was commanded by the word of the Lord. You must not eat bread or drink water or go back the way you came. So he went another way. He did not go back the way he had come to Bethel. God had given this prophet specific instructions. Now, a lot of us, God has given instructions, but we like to, to do things our own way. You know, we, we like to, to, you know, justify things and say, well, you know, you know, this won't hurt, you know, too much. But I'm glad to see that this man of God was so obedient that the king was saying, hey, you know, come in, let me, let me feed you, let me give you drink, you know, let me give you a reward for restoring my hand, you know, let me give you this, let me give you that. And so many people, even though God had told them what to do, would probably say, okay, this won't hurt, you know, too much, and just go on, you know, about their about the, the way of the king into his house eating his food but I'm glad to see that this man of God was obedient he was obedient to what the Lord had commanded him now <coughs> there were different people that were around the altar that day there were people gathered around and one of them what, or a few of them were the sons of an older prophet, an older man of God that was there in the town. And they rushed home and they told their father about what they had saw. They say that they had saw God rip apart this altar. They had saw God restore this, this man's hand. And they had saw him refuse the king. And something Something began to spark inside the, the old prophet at that point. Brother Michael, you said it earlier. You know, sometimes pe people feel a spark every now and then. And, you know, it, it reignites something inside their life. And then, you know, they'll, they'll be eager and anxious to get back in the church, to get back into the Word of God, to get back into a prayer life. But it seems like the minute that something goes wrong or bad happens, they fall right back out of the, off the wagon. Right back off the wagon. It doesn't take a whole lot to, you know, to push them over. But something sparked inside of this old prophet. And he said, I want to speak to this man of God. I want to see him. And so he, he got on his donkey and he went to go meet him. And when he got to him, in verse 15 there, it says that he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. 
But he answered, I cannot go back with you, eat bread, or drink water with you in this place. For a message came to me by the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there, or go back by the way you came. He said to him, I am also a prophet like you. An angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. The old prophet deceived him, and the man of God went back with him, ate bread in his house, and drank water. Now, this, this young prophet, I'm sure even though he was, he was obedient, he also, he also was kind of green. If he might know what green means, it means that, you know, he didn't have the experience and he didn't have the amount of years on him like this old prophet had. And so he was, he was able to be influenced. And this old prophet, he used his influence to get this man of God back to his house. But it says the old prophet deceived him, even though he said that he had heard from angels, because that would probably, that would make me feel good if somebody told me, hey, some angels told me that it was okay for you to come back, back to my house, because I am also a man of God. That would make me say, well, you know, okay, that doesn't seem too bad. You know, if, he, if you heard it from angels, you know, the, the angels, you know, uh, you know, were, were placed, you know, just above us in heaven at that point in time. So, you know, it, it must be okay. And it says that that man of God went back and he ate and he drank at this old prophet's house. And it says in 1 Kings, verse 23 there, a little bit further down, it says, so after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk, the old prophet saddled the donkey for the prophet he had brought back. When he left, a lion attacked him along the way and killed him. His corpse was thrown on the road and the donkey was standing beside it. The lion was standing beside the corpse too. I want you to know that the influence that this old prophet, this old man of God, had on this, this younger man of God, it cost him his life. It cost him his life. It led him down a path that he knew that he wasn't supposed to go down. And the only reason that he went down it was because he trusted this man of God. Because of the experience he had, because of the influence that he had on him, and I begin to think, you know, all of us, all of us, we have influence on somebody. We all have influence on somebody, but somebody has also had an influence on us. Over the years, somebody's had an influence on us. And it's important who we allow to have an influence on us. 1 Corinthians 15 and 33 it says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. You know, sometimes you can be the, you can be the, the most strong-willed person. You can be, you know, the faithful and, and standing firm. And if you're around the wrong people long enough, it'll begin to wear off on you. You'll slowly start to fade into those things that they are doing. The title to my message this morning is Are You Under the Influence? Are you under the influence? Now, most of the time when we hear those three words, under the influence, we think about alcohol. We think about alcohol because 
You know, so many people, you know, get stopped and they're driving under the influence of alcohol or, or drugs or, or whatever it may be. And that's, and that's, you know, what we begin to think about. But I begin to think about, you know, whose influence am I under? You know, everyone on earth, everyone in this church, you've got influence, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. And your influence is more powerful than you think. Your influence will live on long after you're gone. And the impact of the choices that you make can be felt for generations long. For generations. Think about that. The things that we do can sometimes affect our, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, all down the line what we do. And it's so important that we let them know who we serve, why we serve, and we show them how to serve God. 1 Timothy 4 and 12, it says, let no one despise your youth. Instead, you should be an example to the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. If you go down to verse 15 there, it says, practice these things. Be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all. Two things that really stick out to me right there. In verse 12, it says, be an example. Be an example. And then the second thing, in verse 15, it says, so that your progress may be evident to all. Evident. One of the things I've heard many pastors say, I've said it before myself, but if you were to stand trial for being a Christian, a man or a woman of God, would there be enough evidence for you to be found guilty? Would there be enough evidence? Would people see it in your life? Would you have character witnesses? All right, y'all know what I'm talking about, character witnesses? You know, people that have, have been around and they've seen what you've done. They've heard what you've said. I would hope so. You know, there was a poet who wrote these words. It says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. If that's, if that's not true, I don't know what it is. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. You want to know a big problem with the church right now? It's because the one reason that the church is struggling right now is because not, not just the church members, but the people behind the pulpit can't get their act together. The people behind the pulpit don't set the example that they need to. If y'all don't think that I take this stuff seriously, you're wrong. I take this very seriously. There's a lot of things I like to joke about in my life. You know, I, I, I joke about, you know, my, my weight, you know, I, I joke, you know, about all different kinds of things. I'm a funny guy. Y'all can laugh. I, I know I am. I love to make people laugh. I really do. But I don't want to become the joke. I don't want to become the joke behind the pulpit, behind the words. Because God has set me in this place. Was I qualified? Absolutely not. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I was not qualified to be up here. I'm glad that my qualifications didn't lie on what other people thought it was where God wanted me to be. There were plenty of people in the Bible that weren't qualified to be put in the position that they were put in, but God put them there anyway. God put them there because he saw a heart he saw a heart that was going to be committed. He saw a heart that was not going to turn. He saw a heart that was rooted into the foundation.
foundation. And that's what I want to be. I want to be rooted into the foundation, but I don't ever want to set a bad example for anybody in this church. But more importantly, I don't want to set a bad example for my children. Because my children, my children, they're going to go and they're going to have their own children someday. And then those children are going to have children. And I want the actions and the words and the choices that I used and that I made, I want them to set an example for those future generations to come. Those future generations. If you don't think that stuff like this morning was important, then you missed the boat. That is so important. I thought Brother Michael was going to start preaching my message here earlier when he talked about the three sitting on this first pew. That they were up here singing. They're up here, they got their hands lifted. They're up here worshiping. Why? Because they've seen us do it. They've seen us do it. Well, I can go ahead and tell you, how old is Taylor, Amanda? Eight. I guarantee you, somewhere, somewhere, you might have to go look for it, but somewhere there's probably an eight-year-old that's probably already smoking cigarettes. That's probably already starting to drink some alcohol or something because it's lying around the house. And they've seen their parents do it, so they think that it's okay because the example has been set. Your influence means so much more than you can truly ever determine inside your mind. It means everything. There was an author, another author that wrote, we teach what we know, but we reproduce what we are. You can teach somebody something all you want to, but until they see you doing it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. I'm so glad that that God gave me awesome examples of what a child of God should be, what a true Christian should be. And not only that, not only that, but they, they, they showed me, you know, how to have joy in life. You know, how that, that I didn't need, you know, alcohol or some drug to have a good time. We've had plenty of good times. And, and all I've been drinking is sweet tea. And I'm not drinking sweet tea right now. Maybe it's got a little bit of angst inside of me. Um, because, man, that's what I, I love some sweet tea. But I don't need all that other stuff to have fun. Heck, I'd rather remember what I did having fun than, you know, going and getting tore up from the floor up and not being able to remember. I, I, I asked somebody one time at work, and this was not too long ago, they said, man, this weekend was awesome. And I was like, well, what y'all do? He's like, man, I can't even really remember. I just know it was good. And I'm like, great story. Great story. You know, if we're under the influence of other things like that, things can become a blur. Things can get lost. But if we are under the influence of God, if we are doing things the way that they should be done, then we'll remember those things. We'll be able to teach those things to our children and the people around us. You know, your children, they may sometimes, they may doubt what you say, but they'll always believe what you do. I saw it not just from my parents, but I saw it from, from other people's parents that, that I was around. I saw them live lives that were holy and righteous. I saw people that sought after God with everything they've got. People that, that loved each other. True love. People that loved God. And they gave Him everything they had. I saw that on a on a daily, on a weekly basis. There's times that that I, I find myself laughing because I have developed tendencies like my parents. 
especially, you know, talking on the phone to my dad. I'll, I'll you know, the word sucker, I, I use it just like it does. And when I go to get off the phone, it's, it's the same, same exact way. If he says it before me, then I mean, I'm just like, man, that's like listening to myself. And it's because I've heard it so many times over the years. Countless, countless times. And so I have applied it to myself. You know, if you if you want your children to have a prayer life, then you better have one. If you want your children to be in church, don't send them to church. Take them to church. If you don't want your children using foul language, then you better watch what comes out of your mouth. If you don't want your children smoking or drinking or using drugs or, or you know, looking at pornography and all these things, then you better leave that stuff alone. Because the minute that they see you doing it, you have enabled them. You have enabled them. One of the things I've always said, I, you know, I'm not going to stand up here and I'm not going to rip anybody apart. I'm not. You know, alcohol is one of those things, that, and drugs, they're, they're one of those things that they can lead down a dark path. Now, not on the drugs part, I, I really, you know, stay away from those. But I know that there's a lot of people that, that drink alcohol in modesty. And if you do that, and God hasn't given you conviction, conviction, then you know what? That's between you and God. Go pray about it. That's all I can say. Go pray about it. But I want you to know, I want you to know that when your children, when they see you having the occasional drink, then they're going to say, okay, well, I can have an occasional drink. But who's to say that that child is the one who can't handle it? If that child is the one who turns into the alcoholic, and then it leads them down a path that you never would have wished for them. Now, I know that there are times that, you know, children make their own choice and you can only do so much, but all I'm saying, all I'm saying is if you don't want them doing it, you need to cut it out of your life as well. Because I don't want my children to have to struggle with things like that. I don't want them to have to have an addiction to, to cigarettes or alcohol or anything like that. This is the most important part right here. Proverbs 22 and 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When I think about that word train, you know, I thought about the many, many things that I've been trained to do in my lifetime. You know, I've played sports, I've had lots of coaches. I, you know, all the way from little league to you know playing football in, in middle school and high school. And then you know I, I go and work for my dad, and and he trained me on how to you know build a house and how to do things properly. You know one of the one of the one of the things that I get told countlessly by people that my dad has built a house for is he said you know what your dad does it right. And he doesn't cut any corners, so I know it's going to be a solid house. And it, it's funny because I thought about that, and I thought about it spiritually. That he did the same thing in our household. He didn't cut any corners. He did things the right way, and he built a strong home. He built a strong house. And I think about these things, especially... You know, being trained, you know, in sports and with my dad. That whenever we were out there and the coach told you to go do something, he would go show you what to do. And then he'd say, all right, guys, that's the way I want it done. That's the way that it needs to be done. That's the expectation. And so when I begin to think about that word trained, it goes along with 
with that coaching mentality that, you know what, if you want to train them, then show them the way that things should be done. Show them what a prayer life should be. Show them what studying the word is. Show them what fasting is. Show them what going to church and being committed looks like. Because when they can see it and they believe it, you've had that positive influence on their life. And we need our young people to have that influence in their lives right now. Because when they leave this place and when they go out into the school systems and they go, you know, to the ball field, they're, they're, there's no telling what they're hearing. I'm not going to pick on anybody this morning, but I'm going to say this about somebody that's not currently here, but I very highly respect them, and they are very protective about where their child goes as far as who their child spends the night with or goes over to their house. And I'm also like that to a degree. But you have to be like that as parents. You have to be protective because you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. There's been plenty of people that I've seen that, you know, I thought were upright, you know, good, you know, honest, you know, you know, had morals, you know, people like that. And then all of a sudden you see them in the news and, you know, they're busted for some kind of, you know, child pornography or something like that. And you're just, it blows your mind. You gotta be in prayer. You gotta be in protection mode when it comes to your children. Because the things that they are subjected to can make a huge impact on their life. The influence that people have on them, and they are looking up to us. They're looking up to us to see how things should be done, how to handle things, how to act, how to react, what's right, what's wrong. But they are also looking up to other people that they see as adults. Because when they when they get around other people, they say, well, oh, you know, they're they're the same age as, you know, mama and daddy. So, you know, they, they must know what's best for me. And then they can be influenced in a negative manner. It's so important that we protect, we protect our children. Now I want to turn this around. <clears throat> Spiritually, we have people that are coming in through those doors, that are going to come in through those doors, that they are like children, spiritually. They may be 40 years old, but they may not have been in church their whole life. They're coming in here, and Paul talks about it as, as them being babies in Christ. Babies. Even though, I mean, it's funny to think of a, you know, a 40 year old man as being a baby. He is. And when, when those people come in through those doors, we have to show them how to worship. We have to show them, you know, how, how you know, a Christian life is lived, how a righteous and holy life is lived. It's on us. We have to mentor them. And nurture them and show them the way, just like as you know, as, as you know, natural babies, you know, you have to, you know, teach them, you know, how, how to walk. You know, you have to work with them on, you know, talking and, and reading and, and writing and all these different things that, that they begin to develop the same thing spiritually. So when people come into this place, what are they seeing? Are they seeing what we talked about last week as people that are pursuing God with everything they've got? True worshipers? Are they seeing something that's fake? Something that's just thrown up, you know, just to look good? I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but, you know, a, a big reason that the church is falling apart, I mentioned it earlier, is because the man behind the pulpit. But it's also that there are people out there in the congregations that they come in here and they're one person on Sunday morning and then they walk out those doors and they're a completely different person. And if you go to their home, 
You see something different. You know, I'm just saying, it hurts your credibility when people see that you are different when you're not in these doors, in this house. It hurts your credibility. You know, I, I don't want to be somebody that's fake. I don't want to be somebody that's, that's, you know, trying to, you know, put up a front or anything like that. I feel like I'm always honest with y'all. Do y'all feel like I'm, I'm honest? Sometimes I'm probably a little too honest with y'all. I'll tell you this, something that I'm really, really having to work on right now is that Stafford, she throws these bad temper tantrums sometimes. And man, you know, she will let you have it. And I mean, she's just, you know, she'll get like fighting mad sometimes. And I'm like, you know, what in the world? And then I think back. She's seen me get like that before. Maybe that's why she does it. No, not maybe. That is why she does it. Because she thinks it's okay. Because she sees Daddy do it. Don't do it all the time. It very rarely happens that I get really, really angry. But when I do, I go into like Hulk mode. I turn it, and you laugh, but I turn into a different person. I turn into somebody that's not me. I turn into somebody that, you know, I can't feel pain. And, you know, you can hit me with whatever you want to. And, you know, I'm not going to feel it. Somebody has to talk me down. And it's not right. I shouldn't be like that. It's something that I'm working on. But you know, I, I told Stafford, I said, you know, baby, you can't do that. And I, and I told her, I said, I know that you, you've seen it from me. I know that you've learned it from me. But it's not right. I said, just know that Daddy's working on it too. If we don't teach them what's right and what's wrong, then we're missing the boat. We're missing the boat. Speaking of a boat, Hebrews 11 and 7, it talks about Noah. It says, By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. He built that ark to save his family. To save his household. You know what? Some of us need to build an ark around our house so we can protect those who are most important to us. To help us when the floods come. But I love hearing this verse in Hebrews 11 and 7. It says that he moved with godly fear. Think about that. He moved with godly fear. God told him what was going to come. It hadn't even ever rained before. Think about that. Never rained before. But Noah trusted. He had faith in God. And he was obedient. And it says that he moved with that godly fear. But then it says, he condemned the world. He condemned the world. All these people that were telling him that he was crazy. All these people that kept on telling him that, you know, he, he was wasting his time. That, that, you know, nothing like that was going to happen. Those were the same people running for their lives. Knocking on that door trying to get into that ark. When the floods finally came. I want you to know this morning. That there's a flood that's coming. And it's called Jesus. And there's plenty of people around. That have heard about it and heard about it and heard about it. They've heard that he's coming. And they've said he ain't coming. That's just a, just a bunch of baloney. You know, that, that's not going to happen. Those are going to be the same people that when he comes and he takes his bride and carries us away, that they're going to be wondering why they did what they did. 
why they made the choices that they made, why they didn't live a life that was pleasing to God. You know, Noah set an example for his household of being obedient. There might have even been, you know, some of the kids at some point that said, you know what, dad's crazy. Dad's nuts. I'm sure my kids have, if not, if they haven't said that already, they're going to. Dad's an idiot. That's what they'll say. But you know what, they, they, they will respect me. And Noah had that respect. And even though, even if the kids thought that he was a little, you know, nutty, they got on that boat. And it saved them. When they got off the boat, when they got off the ark, I want you to pay attention to the first thing that Noah did. Now, a lot of people would think, you know, well, we got off this ark. This is where we were living for all this time. You know, so, you know, we need to build a house. The first thing Noah did when he got off the ark wasn't build a house. He built an altar. He built an altar because he knew what was most important in his life. And he wanted to go ahead and set another example for his kids that, hey, offering a sacrifice of praise to God is the most important thing that you can do. The most important thing that you can do. If you'll stand with me this morning. A few more verses that I want to read here before we open up these altars. And it can be found in Ephesians 5, 1 through 8. It says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not even be named among you as if fitting for saints Neither filthiness nor foolish talking, no coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I begin to think about that verse 6 right there. It says, let no one deceive you with empty words. I begin to think about that, that young prophet and how he was deceived by the elder prophet, the elder man of God. I want you to know that just because somebody's older than you, just because you feel like somebody's over you or maybe you know has more authority than you have, don't just go with everything that they say. If they tell you something, if they give you some kind of command or, or give you some kind of invitation, pray about it. Seek God. Because once that elder prophet said that he had talked to the angels, that young man of God said, oh, He's already talked to God about it on my behalf. So I don't have to go to him. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't believe everything you hear. Don't just be swayed with whichever way the wind blows. 
always be mindful. Always be thinking. And I, I know that this is kind of cliche, and, and you know, I, I saw it the other day that um, we were getting ready to watch the, uh, the Georgia game, the Orange Bowl, and David Pollock was on before the, the game, and he was talking about the game. And, and I looked at David's wrist, and he had on a WWJD bracelet. What would Jesus do? And I know that it, it, it sounds kind of funny, and it sounds kind of cheesy or whatever you say, but you know what? If we really truly ask ourselves that in every situation, it would keep us out of some of the mess that we get in. Just that simple. What would Jesus do in this situation? I don't want any of us to be influenced in a negative way. I don't want any of us to be taken advantage of. But on the flip side, I want us to hold in strong regard and with high importance the influence that we have not only on our own children, but on our spouse, on our friends, on your church family, everybody around us. I want you to be mindful of that influence that you have. You know, there's times that God has placed you in somebody's life for a reason. And it's not to bring more darkness into their life. It's to bring them out of the darkness. But it becomes a problem when the people that God had placed in that person's life that they start to lead them astray. I want people that when they come into this house, I want people when they come into me, in, in, in my home, that they see somebody that's genuine, that's not put on a show, that's not here to be heard or anything like that. In fact, I don't even want them to to have to hear me. I told somebody this the other day. I said, I feel like I have to speak too much at church. I get tired of listening to myself all the time. I really do. But I want people just to be around me and to watch me and to see me and to see a life that's pleasing to God. I hope that, that you hope want the same for your life. I hope you want the same for the people that are around you, that you want them to, to see a message, not just hear it. But the problem is, is that so many times they hear the words that are coming out, but they don't see the action to back up those words. we got to be more than just talking the talk, but we got to walk the walk. God's looking for those those types of people that will step up and that will be the example, that will be the influencers for this coming generation. Those kids down there, our youth, they're the church for tomorrow. They really are. Before you know it, just like Brother Michael said, Brother Hudson will be up here to lead the praise and worship or something. Don't shake your head, man. It's, it's, it's possible. It's possible. You know, I'd much rather see him doing that than, than other things. I know we can agree on that. You know, I want these children that are coming up, I want them to thrive. I don't want them to struggle. Just as my parents told me so many times, I don't want you to struggle with the, the mistakes and the things that I have done. So I'm telling you these things to try and keep you from hurt, to keep you from pain. If you'll go and get into God's Word, He'll do the same thing. If you communicate with Him, if you talk with Him, He'll lead you exactly where He wants you. And He'll keep you from that struggle. 
we've got to be there for one another. We've got to be there for our children. We've got to be there for this community. And we've got to, we've got to be the real thing. That's what God wants. We've got to be true influencers of the Holy Spirit. And we've got to allow God to speak through us. And if we do that, people can see the fruits that come from us and they're good fruit that's when growth will begin to take place that's what we want to do we say it all the time, come grow with us come grow with us and I do truly feel like we are growing as I said last week, growth is a slow process it's not going to happen overnight But I don't want us to say, come and roll with us when people come in and they see something different out there than they experience in here. I want everything to line up. Everything. So if you're struggling with something this morning, maybe you're struggling with something that you know you got in your life that, that you want to you know, keep from your children, that you want to you know, work on, you know, my being, you know, my full, you know, anger episode, you know, every now and then. Something like that. If you got something that God's working on inside of you, I'm telling you right now, if you'll come lay it at His feet, He'll begin to take it and He'll begin to replace it with something else. Something good. And then we can truly become the servants that He wants us to be. So we're gonna open up this altar here in a second, just like just like Noah. He built an altar of, of praise. He built an altar of sacrifice. If you'll come praise him this morning, if you'll come sacrifice whatever that is to him, if you'll give him everything that you've got, he'll take it and he'll make something great of it. Let's pray this morning. Dear God, we just thank you for this, this opportunity, dear Lord, to, to get into your word, God. Jesus, I thank you for the message that you gave. God, I thank you for the people that have come before me, dear Lord, the, the people that I have looked up to, that have influenced me. God, I pray that you would just let me be that same kind of powerful influencer to this church, to this flock. God, I pray that you would just use our congregation, dear Lord, our, our church family, to be a positive influence in each and every person that they come in contact with. God, I pray that not only do they hear your word being spoken from them, but God, they see your love in each and every action, dear Lord. God, I pray that if we're struggling with something this morning, God, I pray that you just begin to prick our hearts, begin to speak to us this morning, and God, I pray that we would find a place down at this altar to lay it down at your feet, and that we can leave it here, and we can walk out of this place without that burden on us. God, I pray that you would help us to be obedient. Don't let us be swayed by the things in the world. Don't let us be just taken up by each and every whim. But God, I pray that you would just let us be mindful and always in prayer asking ourselves, what would you do? What would you do in this situation? God, I thank you for what you're doing inside of us, dear Lord, right now. I thank you for that growth that I can see slowly starting to take place. Continue to grow, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. These altars are open. If you want to come spend some time in prayer, I urge you to do so.